As a Jehovah's Witness, when you awake from indoctrination and discover that your beliefs are incorrect, you find yourself in an incredibly lonely and challenging position. I liken it to having duct tape put over your mouth and a gun put to your head. In order to survive within the organisation, you must keep that masking tape on and remain silent. If you dare express even one doubt or one newfound belief to anyone within the organisation, you run the risk of that being relayed back to the elders, a judicial committee being formed, and you potentially being disfellowshipped for apostasy. In essence, they pull the trigger, enforce the policy of extreme shunning, and make you dead to your friends, family, and community. For a couple of years, I kept the masking tape on. But by this point, they had been informed about my desire to use my freedom of expression. And so two days after giving an apostate warning talk about me to the whole congregation, they requested to meet up with me in person so they could remind me of the action and the duty that they as appointed men would be required to enforce. I'm going to analyse clips from the conversation wherein we gain key insight into the minds of mentally programmed elders and how it responds to evidence that it's never seen before. And also we're going to hear what reasons these elders put forward to ease their conscience about the horrible, painful predicament that the organisation had put me in. Morrison COVID is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Due to COVID restrictions on meeting indoors, I walked the elders over the river from where I live and into a nearby park where we found a bench to have our discussion. Of course, I was aware that a discussion was the last thing that these elders wanted. They were there out of necessity and duty. However, there were a couple of topics which I felt morally obliged to discuss with them. One of those being images of three fossils which reveal carnivorous behaviour before 6,000 years ago, essentially destroying the Jehovah's Witness timeline on animal history on Earth. And so, after basic mandatory chit-chat, I began by asking them what I considered to be a relatively straightforward question. In your opinion, can a fossil be classed as apostasy? Uh, no, here we go, yeah. because I, what you're trying to say is that you know better and in, in some ways... I'm not saying I know better at all, I'm saying if you pick something up from the ground and it's a fossil, is that apostate? No, of course not. Okay, so... But we're, but we're there's some fossils. talk about those, yeah. those things. So that... what I've got there is three pictures of fossils, right? And this is why I'm going to explain to you why I've come to the decision that the God that you believe in doesn't exist. The first one is a fossil found between 250 to 90 million years ago and it's of an ichthyosaur with another ichthyosaur in its mouth. This one here is a T-Rex tooth that was found embedded in a hadrosaur tail and this one here is a velociraptor and a protoceratops who were buried alive. The velociraptor had the claw in the neck of the protoceratops. The protoceratops had pinned the velociraptor to the floor and they both died. Based on the evidence, if before 6,000 years ago Satan had no influence on the animal kingdom because he was still a good angel. Who are you saying created these animals to eat each other? Uh, yeah, but they, but that may be that may be the plan. Even in the new system, if you believe that animals may still need to control each other, otherwise you'd be overrun by by lots of animals. I don't know the answer. But that's to not these what your things. organization teaches, is it? No. You're taught in the new system you can have a pet lion. Well, that, that, yeah, but the humans and animals. But I don't know all the answers to these questions, Harrison, and I, and I won't until. But, but if we're going to form rational clear. beliefs, yeah. if we're going to form beliefs rooted in evidence, yes. what are you going to base your beliefs on? You're going to base your beliefs on evidence or on the doctrines of eight men in America? But the, oh, it's not the doctrines of eight men in America. It's yeah, they, based on they say it's based the on the Bible, Bible but then yes. everyone has their own, own and interpretations. Any Christian religion based on the Bible will not have the answers to those things because the Bible doesn't touch on dinosaurs. It doesn't touch on any of those things, but it doesn't mean that the Bible is not inspired. So yeah. Jehovah, Jehovah has foreknowledge. Jehovah knew the time period that I live in today is, is coming. Jehovah could almost see me struggling with this doubt me having no answer because the bible doesn't mention it at all and jehovah chose not to write in the bible why he created ginormous killing machines and then why he either made them extinct or allowed them to go extinct if you were jehovah would you have wrote a verse or two in the bible about dinosaurs well it's i can't answer that question harrison looking back i did go in quite hard on this topic with the elders 
but that's only because this was the last opportunity I would ever have to discuss it with them. I believe that this is the single most devastating way of debunking the Jehovah's Witness belief system. And when confronted with this evidence and questioned regarding it, it doesn't matter whether you're an unbaptized publisher or a member of the governing body, you will squirm in your seat and you will speculate all sorts of wild responses. And that's exactly what the elder did. Because on the one hand, you have Jehovah's organization, which uses verses such as the ones in Isaiah 11, which speak of the wolf residing with the lamb, the young goat lying down with the leopard, and a lion eating straw like a bull as a foundation for their belief regarding animals being in peace together in a future paradise. This elder is suggesting that that could all be wrong. That potentially it was Jehovah's grandmaster plan for animals to always be carnivorous and consume each other. That way the evidence I presented is correct, what we see today is no surprise, and in future certain populations of species will still be controlled by predators. While I have to commend this elder for going rogue and doing a bit of independent thinking, when I quizzed him about the fact that humans are depicted in publications by the organisation as having pet lions, he was quick to clarify that there's a big difference. Because that's humans and animals, not animals and animals. If I can envisage this elder's speculative idea about the new system, you could have a starving hungry crocodile looking for food, and stood in the riverbank is a gorilla, a chimpanzee, and a human. And the crocodile goes over to attack one of them. But as he's about to attack the human, he gets a new message in his mental inbox from God saying, you cannot attack the human because they are like the fruit in the Garden of Eden. They are forbidden. But you can tear to pieces the chimpanzee and the gorilla. Although this elder is working in line with the evidence to try and form a more rational belief system, what he speculates still reeks of this Bronze Age narcissistic view of our species, that we are the special, chosen, made in God's image creation of an Israelite deity. Staying on the topics of animals and design, I asked the elders, Who created poisonous berries? You alluded to small insects and you say how apostates talk about small insects. I was bitten by a tick a few days ago, so I've got to go check if I've got Lyme's disease symptoms, things like that. Who created ticks and other parasites, mosquitoes? I know what you're going to say is, we don't know and we can't yeah. know and all that sort of stuff. There's no, good, it's, in, it's there's good not, and bad. It's not if God existed no. it, and he's a God of love, it should just be loving things. It no. shouldn't just... What? So children walk up to a... a moon seed berries they look appetizing the child eats a bunch of them the mum comes along what did you eat the child's on the floor it's in horrific pain and the child dies why would a god create those berries you can't say that satan created no, those berries no okay so i mean as i said on tuesday the way man's ruined this earth we don't know how that's affected the ecosystem do we? but also we're six thousand years from perfection how god created us how much different would we be? Our thinking, our feelings, our immune system, what we could eat, what we can't eat. It we is, we it don't is, know. Yeah. Ah, the famous, we are 6,000 years from perfection line. The ultimate get out of jail free card that can be played at any point in any conversation. Why do so many humans have back problems? We're 6,000 years from perfection. Why did my cat eat that mouse? We're 6,000 years from perfection. Why is the grass green and the sky blue? We're 6,000 years from perfection. The question, why did God create mosquitoes, ticks and poisonous berries, was one of the few questions where I genuinely didn't expect to get that response. But it just goes to show that you can ask virtually anything and you will receive that blanket comeback. Why are some humans born with tails? Atavisms from our evolutionary history. We're 6,000 years from perfection. That was the response of the one elder, but the other elder also had a reply to my question. As he said something very similar elsewhere in the conversation, I'm going to play those two clips back to back. It is it's quite know. a jump again, because you, don't, you won't know all the answers to everything. You know, you, you, and the state of mind you're in, you, you feel that that's a very, very weak answer, it's as though you're failing to see evidence. It's not that. It's not failing to see evidence. It's because of the love and the relationship with the faith that you've built up you don't make the link 
that you're making here. If we look at all the evidence that from everything we see around us, and those going to those clever scientists that look at those things around it, okay, even if they don't believe in a personal God that they can talk to, they give credit to a deity that exists. And then when you start to contemplate that, and, and like you did when you were younger, and build your faith and get to know about that, and prophecy and what it all means, you then realise that that jump, that connection that you've made, cannot be true because of these other factors here. Picture a grandmother who lives at home with her adult grandson. He cooks, he cleans, he does everything possible so that she has a relatively easy life in her old age. She loves him so much, she says he's the greatest man on earth. And therefore, when the police turn up and tell her that he's been arrested for producing and detonating bombs which have killed hundreds of people, she shakes her head and she says, no, nope, that's impossible, that's not my grandson. Even when confronted with the evidence, she refuses to believe it. She refuses to believe what they say and the evidence because it doesn't conform to the manufactured image of the loving grandson that she has created in her mind. That is extremely similar to what's going on here in the minds of these elders when confronted with the evidence. Anything that these elders class as being positive, conditions on our planet that enable life to exist, the compassion of an elephant, the cocoa bean from which we derive chocolate, they automatically make that jump and say, yep, yeah, that's the loving, caring God that I know. He did that. But when they see things which they'd class in a negative bracket, a clan of hyenas disemboweling a baby gazelle, thousands upon thousands of people dying from natural disasters to do with plate tectonics such as earthquakes, babies and children dying from malaria, well, then they'd say, no, no, you cannot make that jump to say that God did it. Why? Because it doesn't conform to the manufactured image of this deity that they've created in their mind. Shouldn't any belief system embrace doubt? Well, OK, go back to Adam and Eve. Satan put doubt into her mind. And that doubt led to her taking the fruit. OK, so it's quite a simple thing. Doubt led to taking that fruit. That led to death, pain. Satan lied. It was doubt that was put into her mind, outright lie, and then it led to her death. And where we are now, we're talking like this because of Adam and Eve. If, if you're about to step on a lake and it's frozen across and you put a foot on it and it starts to crack and you doubt whether that lake can hold your weight up, should you trust your doubts and embrace your doubts or should you just ignore them? If this elder was studying with someone on the ministry, let's say a member of the Church of England, and they said, I'm really enjoying the study with you. And to be honest, I'm starting to doubt my own religion. Do you think this elder would say, oh no, no, you shouldn't doubt. Doubt equals Satan and Eve equals sin equals death. Of course not. He would say, it's fantastic that you're doubting. It shows that you are honest and hungry for the truth. And so it's fascinating to see how decades of mental programming have trained the minds of these elders to view doubts in such a completely negative way when it's about their organisation. The article, Do Not Let Doubts Destroy Your Faith, likens doubts to invading organisms that may destroy your health and even kill you. But as in the example I gave of doubting whether the ice you're standing on could hold your weight, Instead of killing you or being harmful, that doubt is positive. It could potentially save your life. It's your brain's way of letting you know that something isn't right here, that you shouldn't blindly and unequivocally trust something. Especially if you believe that your brain is the creation of the biblical God, because then to ignore or to suppress your doubts is to ignore and suppress the mental faculties that God has gifted to you. Are we really living in the last days? Can you believe everything the Bible says? Is this truly Jehovah's organisation? The organisation says that doubts like those cannot possibly be coming from your own mind. For Satan would love to plant doubts like these in your mind. Why does the organisation operate this way? Well, if they can train you to view having doubts or questions as evil, satanic, life-threatening, 
then they can train you not to trust your own mind. The less you trust your own mind, the more submissive and obedient you will be to their organisation, an organisation that you will trust implicitly. Should you trust your doubts and embrace your doubts or should you just ignore them? No, no. of course. Of course. That's why we have encouraged you to, for, for many months now, haven't we? And we'll even the discussion at our house that we had with John. We, 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 we understood your, your concerns. We don't have the answers to all these questions. We said, look, wherever you look, you won't find those answers and you can keep searching for different things but if you instead focus on your faith and look at those areas and build your faith you can then have a belief and a love of a creator. From the very first time I met with these elders and laid out my questions and my doubts that I would be addressing they tried to convince me that no matter how long I search for the answers no matter how hard I search for the answers, it's a worthless pursuit. Instead of doing that and wasting your time, focus on regaining your faith. Focus on rebuilding that relationship with Jehovah. Essentially, re-indoctrinating yourself. Being completely honest, that's a very tempting option. It's appealing. It's comforting. It's what we know and it's what our heart wants. But if there's one thing I've learned from being a Jehovah's Witness, it's that the heart is more treacherous than anything else and is desperate. Carrying out an unbiased and intellectually honest examination of my entire belief system was emotionally draining, it was mentally demanding and it was time consuming. Realising that truth exists outside the bubble in which I can find myself was a painful experience. The truth hurts. How much easier it would have been to go back to the Kingdom Hall, to plug myself back into the Matrix, to receive the warmth and the love of my friends and family, and to never have to worry again about where that search for the truth would have led me. But not listening to the Elder's advice was the best decision of my life. Contrary to what they said, I did find satisfying answers to the majority of the questions and the doubts that I had. And surprise, surprise, it didn't come from JW.org. And as a species, we have to acknowledge that there are some questions which we may never have satisfying or knowledgeable answers to. But as the old adage goes that I'm sure you've heard a million times now, it's better to have questions you can't answer than answers you can't question. At this point in the conversation, after discussing doubts and evidence, the elders turn the conversation into the direction of something which they are far more comfortable discussing. I guess sometimes you've got to look and think, okay, what's the better way of life? Yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses, are they better people? Are their families better families, happier families than other families? I mean, take your mum, classic example. When she was in the truth, learned the truth, was she a happier person than she is now? She was never baptised, but you're literally just taking the most extreme case well, of exactly. someone who is a smoker, an extreme alcoholic. So which is um, better then? Well, if you I can't take the most extreme and the most extreme. Following God's standards or yeah. following the world's standards? Well, if you look at the relationship between me and my brother, it didn't change at all whether I was Jehovah's Witness or not. Me and my dad, it's broke the relationship and now I'm dead to him for the rest of my life. So you tell me what's better. It really was quite a low blow from this elder to drag my mother into the conversation. Notice though how he describes someone who is mentally damaged from extreme alcoholism as a classic example of the world standards. Not only does this show a real lack of understanding and compassion for addiction, but this also goes to show just how dishonest he is in his reasoning process, and he's completely unaware of it. This is the equivalent of me saying, Take a classic example of the organisation, a child abuser. What's better, who are happier, people in the organisation or people who live by the world standards? I would never argue like that. But unfortunately, this is his mental reality. He sees pictures online and in literature of how the organisation depict worldliness in the world standards and then compares it to the happy smiling faces in the literature and online and at the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witness families. Of course, there are some happy families within the organisation. 
However, when you've been in there for so long, you realise that this is a deceptive outward appearance. Because more often than not, there are an astonishing amount of couples within each congregation who are forced to stay with each other in a loveless and resentful marriage because of the organisation's policies on divorce. Many people, in fact, chose to forego getting married and having children because of the imminency of Armageddon. When that doesn't come, when they're in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, this may lead them to feeling empty and lonely in life. Compare that with young ones who feel this sense of worthlessness and guilt about not being able to physically match up or mentally match up or emotionally match up with the organisation's demands in their life. And then the amount of people who no longer realise it's the truth but are forced to stay in the organisation and not speak out because of fear of losing their friends and family. No wonder there was a local need shortly before I left about the prevalence of depression within the congregation. I can just imagine that anything that is said about stay away from apostate, stay away from anyone who's got a different view, it's almost as though you're trying to block yourself in and not be willing to debate and talk about things and it's, it doesn't sound very healthy from a debating scientific point of view and trying to understand. And, and, but remember, the congregation has come in to the truth, the members of the congregation, they've been and they've made that dedication, they've made that decision, they're enjoying that, that life, they're enjoying the benefits of that faith, and being part of that congregation, we obviously want to protect our brothers and sisters within that congregation. Everyone had a choice, and they continue to have a choice, but for ones to knowingly put themselves in a situation where they're continuing to debate these things, there's a danger that it could end up the same as you. Amazingly, this elder almost concedes that the organisation's lack of being willing to debate and entertain other perspectives doesn't sound mentally healthy. But he reasons that this is okay because those in the congregation have come into the truth. It was their choice to leave the world behind. Almost as if before joining, each member sits down and writes out a list of JW.org and compares it with JW Facts analysing its history, its practices, before making an informed choice. But this basically never happens. It's a complete misrepresentation. In the overwhelming majority of instances, ones are born into this religion and indoctrinated from the womb. As a baby, they are passed around the Kingdom Hall like memorial emblems, and on the ministry, they are pushed from door to door in their pram. My dad said in a message to my brother, Almost everyone who joins the religion tries to prove it wrong. Because of this childhood indoctrination, almost everyone who joins the religion is mentally manipulated so they cannot prove it wrong. They are programmed to believe that everything outside the organisation is Satan's realm. And so why would they research there? Unfortunately, by this point, the organisation has a complete monopoly on that child's young, naive and developing mind. You might say this is not a fair observation, but it's certainly an observation that, that I would make, is that, that you, you change from wanting to talk because you're worried about your faith to actually feeling like you know better and wanting to convince us that our faith is wrong. Well, ideally, what, answer, what I'd whether like that's is... with your dad or whether it's with us or whether it's with John... <laughs> Well, well, what's Dad's intention when he's talking to me over email? What's his plan? Well, he loves you and he wants you to have a belief in... Jehovah and do you think God. I love Dad? Of course you do. And do you want me to... Do you think, you think that I want... Wrong, do you think... You? Well, do you think he thinks I'm wrong? Yeah. Our judgment is that you have already spoken with other people, whether it's when we, I know, voluntarily come to you, that we can see that you're actively pushing your, your thoughts. This clip shows just how much of a persecution complex that exists within the mind of every Jehovah's Witness. For the previous two years, I tried my best to keep the masking tape on, to fade silently. Even when I was receiving kind, sweet text messages off ones in the congregation who don't know any better, I would refuse to reply out of fear that that could be used against me by the elders in future. In that same time period, they arranged to meet up with me five times. They asked me, what are my doubts? To explain them. 
Do I still have those doubts? Do I still identify myself as one of Jehovah's Witnesses? What are my newfound beliefs? Why are those beliefs held? And when I express myself openly and honestly with them, they completely turn the tables and make it sound like I'm some sort of confrontational apostate. They say that I am actively pushing my thoughts on them, that I'm convincing them that their beliefs are wrong and their faith is wrong. Ralph Waldo Emerson describes this as a vulgar mistake. He says, let me never fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that I am persecuted whenever I am contradicted. You have to make a judgment as to someone's position in the congregation and you don't view yourself as a, as a Jehovah's Witness. I've got a letter of disassociation. Have you? The position, as I said to John and Kristen, is when someone comes to my realisation, you have mask and tape put over your mouth and a gun put to your head. That's We're not a, question, a gun to your head. A gun is put to your head because if you take the mask and tape off and use your freedom of speech, what happens to you? You wouldn't be part of the mm. congregation. And you'd be uh, disfellowship. We've got to that. You'd be disfellowship. Anyway, yes. Which means that a gun is put to your head. How is, that, cr- how is that a gun, Harrison? Because you're then dead to your family, friends, and community. Um, but you're not wanting to associate with these people anyway. No one is putting a gun to your head. That's not fair. Oh, has you make it sound so nasty. When people reply in this manner to the analogy I give, I say that this analogy doesn't even begin to do the situation any degree of justice. For a bullet through the head is an instant in time. It's an instant of pain if there is even any pain whatsoever. But a lifetime of shunning, of being treated as if you're dead by your own friends and family, is potentially a lifetime of pain. Depending on the person, it could lead them into depression and even into taking their own life. I know that the elders don't enjoy this comparison. They don't think it's entirely accurate, but it must register to some degree in their subconscious, a degree of truth to it, because they say things to ease their conscience about the situation that the organization is putting you in. One of which being, but you're not wanting to associate with these people anyway. What an incredible thing to say. To speak in my behalf and tell me that I do not wish to see my own family. If you find that amazing, what's even more astonishing is the fact that the organisation have convinced its members that if someone chooses to leave, that they are the ones who are shunning them. As my dad said to me in an email, disassociation means you rejecting your family, brothers and sisters. When we go on the ministry, people have a choice and they a decision. You know, if somebody says, no, I don't want anything, I don't believe it all, we go, fine, that's fine. And it's the same with you. If that's your decision, you know, it's not what we want, but that's, that's your decision. And that's... You, you, do you think this is what I want? To be sat here right now talking to you two guys, about potentially being viewed as dead by my family. Is this something that I want? Well, this it's a choice or a decision that you've made, isn't it? It's not being shunned by your family. It's a decision that you've made to, to go down this path, isn't it? And so what should I do? Just be a hypocrite and say that, oh, it all makes sense, it's all no. true. They actually compared my situation with that of someone on the ministry who says no. I can't think of one way in which that is at all a fair comparison. For someone on the ministry to say no, to exercise their freedom of religious belief and their freedom of expression, they lose nothing. And yet for me to do the same, I would lose, and I did lose, almost everything. The level of narcissism that surrounds this organisation and that perpetuates it from head to toe is off the scale. I cannot imagine the amount of sympathy of support, of condolences, my dad would have received since I left the religion. Not because he sacked me, not because he shuns me, not because he went round the entire family in my friendship group telling them not to talk to me under any circumstance, but because I left Jehovah, because I rejected him, the family, and the whole organisation. How absurd this false reality is. If anyone was in a, in a club 
a golf club or whatever and they're just saying look I don't agree with this I'm coming in the clubhouse not wearing anything and they would say you're not a member anymore because you're not following those approaches now it's not a club like that where we've got man-made rules but we've got a theocracy this Alda clarifies that the difference between the organization and something like a golf club is the fact that the golf club has man-made rules while the organization on the other hand is a theocracy it purely follows the bible as he mentions dress code let's just highlight the topic of dress and grooming and ask if the organization's teachings and practices regarding what's acceptable and what's not acceptable fall under the category of man-made or bible sourced a couple of years ago i was the visiting brother at a nearby congregation doing the public talk and i thought i would give this special occasion the reverence and the respect that it deserves and so i wore my wedding jacket and trousers big mistake I didn't know it at the time, but a couple of days later, I got a phone call off one of the elders saying, Harrison, we enjoyed the talk, but we did want to point out that if you ever want to come back to our Kingdom Hall and do a public talk again, you must wear a suit. As hard as I've searched the Bible from page to page, I've never been successful in finding a verse which says you must wear a suit on the platform and not a smart jacket and trousers. About a year before that, I decided I would grow my hair out a bit longer to see how it looked. Spoiler alert, it doesn't look great, so I'm not probably not going to do it again. Every meeting that went by, I would get a new comment off a new person saying, when are you going to get that thing cut? As a male, you are not allowed to have long hair in this organisation. Why? So many Bible characters will have had long hair. But no, it's not acceptable. Again, show me the Bible verse that backs up the teaching. Women, you can't wear trousers in the hall. Men, is he, is he growing a beard? Someone needs to counsel him. Everything that I've just discussed falls under the category of man-made rather than theocratic and Bible-based. And that's just dress and grooming. We haven't gone into the practices, the history and the real doctrine of the religion. From blood transfusions, blood fractions, to birthdays. But one teaching, one doctrine that people within the organisation will say is never man-made, is the teaching to do with shunning. This isn't a Jehovah's Witness thing. I'm not making this up. It's, it's, it's clearly in the, in the, in the Bible. No, in 1947, a... the Awake, it said that excommunication is pagan, unscriptural and finds no support in the scriptures. A few years later, 180 degrees. In fact, it's a loving provision of Jehovah. Don't what, worry why? about that magazine there. I can read myself the Apostle Paul in Corinthians when he said, don't even say hello, don't eat and greet him. I like this elder's attitude. Tossing Jehovah's Witness literature to one side and saying, I don't need that. I can read the Bible for myself. And I've concluded that shunning is scriptural and that it should be enforced. But I'm not getting too carried away. Because do you really think this elder would hold the same view if the organisation believed that shunning was still, as it said in 1947, pagan and unscriptural? Of course not. He wouldn't be an elder if he did. But this elder's rather rash dismissal of this 1947 Awake magazine perfectly demonstrates the whole organisation's viewpoint of past publications, the life cycle of a piece of Jehovah's Witness literature. It begins as freshly baked spiritual food straight from Jehovah's heavenly oven. And over time, it becomes stale, outdated, and eventually even classed as apostasy. I can guarantee in 100 years time, eighth generation Jehovah's Witnesses will be discussing an article from 2021 and they will say, what, what, why are we looking at that article? They will dismiss it and rubbish it the same way that this elder dismissed and rubbished the article from 1947. After listening to those clips, you may be wondering, did you really need to have that conversation with the elders? You knew that they were just there out of necessity and on business. Couldn't you have just sent them your letter of disassociation in the post? To me, this wasn't business. 
This wasn't the routine operation of a high control group. This was my life. And although the conversation was painful... I mean, this hurts to be having this conversation. It hurts me very much. It does. I felt morally obliged to have it because I cared for them. They were my friends. And despite our differences of opinions and differences of beliefs, at the end of the conversation, I still gave them a big hug and said, All right, guys, lots yeah, of love. You be careful. Yeah, All the best. I'm more than aware that you can't force someone into changing their beliefs. But we simply can't underestimate the power of potentially planting a seed in someone's mind that will come to fruition later on. While I walked away from that conversation as a free man, liberated from the physical and psychological chains put upon me when I woke up and realised the truth about this organisation, they may have sat there and read the letter of disassociation between them that I handed to them. I know not everyone will be interested in what I had to say in that letter, but for those who are, I will read it. As you are aware, for the last couple of years, I've been investigating the beliefs I was raised by my family to accept. The existence of a supernatural god with a specific personality, that this god inspired an ancient book, and that Jehovah's Witnesses are the one and only true religion following that book properly. When I began to address my doubts, I did so in the hope that the truth I had been taught by the people I trusted and respected the most from being a child would be reinforced as fact. With every fibre of my existence, I desired the doctrines of Jehovah's Witnesses to be correct. I knew the devastating consequences of this not being the case. That journey has resulted in many tears and sleepless nights. If now, after carrying out honest-hearted, multi-perspective research, I decided to stay a Jehovah's Witness, it would be an absolute insult to my brain. All of us should be comfortable to analyse our belief system and adapt it to what the evidence suggests to be true, rather than stubbornly sticking to the words of an old book and the words of a group of men in America. When someone in my position comes to the conclusions I have, there is no clean way of leaving the organisation. Do you believe that humans should have freedom of speech? I believe we should all have freedom of speech. That includes you going around convincing people Armageddon is coming. Well, I desire to exercise my freedom of speech to tell others the reasons why I left the organisation and what I currently believe and why. But in order to do so, I have lost my family, my friends, my community and my job. When you tear out a man's tongue, you are not proving him a liar. You're only telling the world that you fear what he might say. This letter is to state that I no longer recognise myself as a Jehovah's Witness and do not wish to be recognised by anyone else as a Jehovah's Witness. I am withdrawing my membership from the Redditch Central Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses and from Watchtower. I am disassociating. I am putting a bullet through my own head before the organisation does. I hold no grudges against any of you elders on the body. I wish you a truly happy life. But the truth should never fear investigation. So if you have questions, if you have doubts, embrace them. If in future any of you decide to embark on an honest, unbiased, multi-perspective search for truth, which results in you waking from your mental indoctrination, there is no doubt that you will lose a lot that you currently hold dear. However, the reward of a free mind and a belief system rooted in evidence and rational thinking is worth losing everything for. Be assured if this happens, I will be there with open arms. Lots of love, Harrison Cother. There are some people who leave this organisation who are hesitant in acknowledging and referring to it as being a cult. However, there are fundamental features that all cults have in common. When we consider staying in a group because we cannot bear the loss, disappointment and sorrow our leaving will cause for ourselves and those we have come to love, we are in a cult. If there is any lesson to be learned, it is that an ideal can never be brought about by fear, abuse and the threat of retribution. When family and friends are used as a weapon in order to force us to stay in an organisation, Something has gone terribly wrong.